the way to approach your bosses. Can I be in these meetings? Can I shadow you? And you do what shadows do, which is to follow. Mm -hmm. That's all shadows do. Because I'm very content and I'm making more than I ever thought I would make in my life. Um, and I feel very grateful for that. But then, you know, sometimes change is good. But when do I know to make that change? There's a couple of things here we want to parse out. The first one is that the, the kind of projects that you get aren't always tied to the environment that you work in. There are places where they do great, amazing, flashy, shiny work, and they they work uh, normal hours, and it's not insane. But you're right to be cautious because the studios that do really high-end, polished work that everybody covets, their the owners and the creative directors have impossibly high standards, and so then you're not having that level of autonomy and you're not getting high fives and slaps on the backs like you used to because whatever you do their expectation is three times of what you do and not mm -hmm. only in terms of quality but also in volume one of the best yeah. shops to work for in motion design uh, was to work under kyle cooper and you're going to learn so much and many of the people who have amazing careers and a body of work today went through uh, his company at one point or the other but it was brutal it was demanding it was really hard and you have to kind of just decide for yourself, is that what I want for my life? Conversely, you also don't want to show up to a corporate job, collect a nice paycheck, but do work that doesn't have any real meaning to you because eventually, and it doesn't take a long time, in about two to three years, your work will become irrelevant to the job market where people will look at it and it's like, uh, that's not very good. Mm -hmm. I know people on both sides, so this is a cautionary tale. You, you don't want to go on either ends of the spectrum I know a guy, a former student of mine, former intern of mine, former freelancer. He ultimately took a job at a very corporate place and he and he, he was married and then he ultimately had a kid. And I could see that uh, this bright star, uh, the luster on his star or the shine was starting to dim. And within a few years, uh, we would just stop reaching out to him because it's like, you're not keeping up with what's going on. Mm. So he clocked into the corporate world. and. He knew what he was doing because he's like, I need a stable job. I, I want to have barbecues on the weekend. I want to do my, I put in my solid eight hours. I don't want to worry about the rat race. And I respect him for doing that. Objectively or subjectively speaking from the outside, his ascent tapered off and he hit his, uh, his creative arc and growth. And I think he, it's kind of sad to say that you hit your, your apex, like just mid twenties. And that's what happened to him. On the opposite yeah. side, I've seen people who are so gung-ho, they they say goodbye to a good job with people who care about them doing good work to chase the, you know, to, to chase the rainbow or whatever the expression might be. I think that's Skittles. Mm -hmm. To chase whatever it is they want to chase, fame, notoriety, cool projects, uh, a cool, uh, you know, crazy, amazing uh, art director, creative director they want to work under. They disappear into mm -hmm. these holes. They do fantastic work. Three years later, they've got this amazing work, but they're like zombies. There's nothing left. Mm -hmm. And now they're they're just um, a flicker of the flame that they used to be, you know? And that's sad too. So I think you have to kind of feel it out and you kind of mm. pace yourself to know that this isn't, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon and the marathon lasts your entire life. So you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you approach it with that kind of mindset. The last little bit of advice I'm going to give to you is if you do your corporate job and you're yearning to sow your wild oats, so to speak, and do crazy cool projects, nothing stops you from doing that after hours, your, your five to nine and your weekends. And you post that work on portfolio sites and you grow an audience for that. And it's kind of neat to be able to develop your own unique style approach and hypothetical projects that you're never going to get to work on because mm -hmm. all of a sudden when your bosses and, and your superiors see that they're going to say that's really cool we should be putting Annie on the cooler new business to help us get that or mm -hmm. something more likely will happen which is clients who want that will reach out to you directly and mm -hmm. you start to begin your career as an independent business owner yeah. so I don't think any job any boss should be the answer to all of your problems 
they're just an answer to one or two of your problems and it's unrealistic to expect that from them as it's unrealistic to expect you to be the answer to all of their problems right it goes both ways does that mm. make sense yes yes as a designer you might not actually get that client interaction client relationship because everything comes down from like your creative director like the creative director is the one that meets the clients and asks the questions and you you are the one that like interprets after he comes to you like after the creative director comes and tells you like what is needed i would feel a lot more fulfilled if i was more a part of that those conversations like having more of that client relationship but because i don't get it as much and i get cuz it's a small team that i have um that sometimes like our roles like we just have to do what we need to do sometimes and but when i do freelance on the side i feel a lot more fulfilled because i even though it's more work because i have to do everything like all the admin the strategy like selling my process and doing rounds and round like of the revisions and contract writing and all that stuff i i think at the end of the day like i feel very fulfilled because i get to interact with my client and really feel that human bond their relationship which i don't know if this is something that a lot of designers don't get at like a full-time job you know yeah no you don't unless you want it unless you raise your hand and say you know boss uh next time we do a client meeting would it be okay if i just shadow you to kind of see what's going on uh, i want to grow in that aspect too the way to approach your bosses can i be in these meetings can i shadow you and you do what shadows do which is to follow mm -hmm. that's all shadows do okay yeah you're right you know, just say it like people that. like John are just hiding in the back, scared to for me to say hello to them. So it's not likely that they're going to say, hey, next time you have that big, really important pitch where we can lose uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, can I be part of that? So when he's ready, he'll say yeah. that. I think I think what I need to do is I have to give them more confidence that I would even give anything of value in that in those conversations. I think for myself, I feel like I don't know if I will even say anything or if I'll just be that weird person on Zoom who doesn't say anything the entire time and just listens <laughs> and doesn't talk. <laughs> um, I think that's my fear. I feel like hmm. I should be giving value because I asked to be in this conversation. Okay. Let me let me help you out with that part, okay? There's a couple of things that you're saying that I want to help you see in a different light. Let me reframe that. Uh, before you're ready, you should ask. Okay, you should ask before you're ready so that they know that's your intention because just because you ask doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. So it could be right. days, weeks, months, years later that they're like, oh, here's an opportunity. Number two, it's not wise for you to think that you're in those meetings to contribute and say something. And that the quiet person, you may see them as weird, but they're listening. And when you don't know what you're doing, you, you should default to listening. The best thing that you can do in these kinds of meetings is just to take amazing notes. Mm. So after the meeting, you can say, boss, I wrote down some of the notes and I, I, I organize them in with the summary, the to do's and what we agreed on and who said what. And I just sent that to you. And thanks for letting me be part of the meeting. Mm. Your objective is to to witness, to observe, not to say like, hey, boss, I got an idea. Stop talking. You know, that mm -hmm. would pretty much potentially end your job there if you did that and it wasn't premeditated. What you don't yet understand is a lot of times these meetings are choreographed and the, the greater the importance, the more money that's on the line. They're very choreographed. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the roles, how they should respond. And the last mm -hmm. thing they need is for you to either change the flow or to give them a bad response. And so when you're invited to a meeting, I think you should be very clear with yourself that you're not the weirdo on the call or in the room that's not saying anything. You're the smart person who's listening, who's watching, who's taking notes and being of service to the people who brought you in the room. They did not bring you in the room to win the business, to save the company, or to respond to a client objection or to offer up unsolicited ideas because that's a very dangerous thing for you to do. I hope that makes sense. Hey everyone, Matthew and Sina here. I'm the Chief Content Officer at The Future. If you enjoyed today's episode, drop a comment below with a timestamp of your favorite part. Don't forget to check out our other videos linked here. 
And if you like this video and want to support us in our mission to bring high quality creative education to the masses, consider buying a course from us and level up your own skills in the process. Thank you so much for your support and we'll see you in the future.